when I was a graduate student, um, I was a philosophy student, and actually just, just down the road. And uh, I was steeped in the study of vision with scientists. And I remember I sat down one day with a vision scientist. Sorry, excuse me. I sat down with an artist. That's the crucial point of my little anecdote. I sat down with an artist, and I, he asked me, well, what is vision science about? And I said, well, in vision science, we um, try to understand how it is that we enjoy an experience of the three-dimensional, spread out, colorful world around us when what we're given are tiny, upside down, distorted images in the eyes. How do we see so much on the basis of so little? And he pondered, and he furrowed his brow, and then he blurted out nonsense. The interesting question is not how we see so much on the basis of so little, but why we see so little when there is so much around us to see. And um, I offer that uh, as, a, as, a, as a motto for, um, for my presentation. I hadn't planned on mentioning it, but I was inspired by Natasha's uh, setting, setting up a sense of opposition between me and, and um, traditional cognitive science in her introductory remarks. Um, I have discovered as I've gone on over the past years in my own work on the nature of perception and perceptual consciousness and consciousness that I keep coming back to the insight that, or at least to what I take to be the insight, that the artist was right in that, in that exchange. And um, it's, it's something I also wanted to mention because in some sense I feel it positions me as a philosopher in relation to artists. I continuously find um, not that my theoretical or academic training uh, gives me insight into what they are doing, but rather that conversation with them teaches me something about the phenomena that I'm interested in. Um, but this is not what I wanted to talk about. Um, my, my real topic today is I wanted to say something about organization and reorganization and uh, that the relationship between those ideas and the work of art, very much responding to remarks that Bruno Latour made yesterday and also Thomas Saracino's work. Um, um, and so I thought I'd begin by, by remarking that Plato once said that it's easy to make a picture. You just hold up a mirror. And in one sense, that's an obviously batty remark. There's all the difference in the world between a mirror reflection and a picture. Um, we make pictures. We, we stumble upon or find reflections in the natural world. But in another sense, I think, um, Plato was onto something. And what he was onto was the idea that Although a picture is one thing and a mirror reflection is another, it may be that our relationship to mirror images, and in particular our relationship to reflections of ourself in mirrors, is shaped by the existence of pictures. Um, and I've been thinking about this a lot lately in relation to the work of the historian Anne Hollander, uh, who many of you, whose work you'll, you'll know, and who passed away just a few weeks ago. Um, her book from the 1970s called Seeing Through Clothing is a brilliant ex exploration of this idea that pictures shape the way we see. Um, so she had the idea, and she just lays it out in this marvelous way looking at the history of art. She had this idea that the way we think about the dressed human body, the way we think about the clothed person is shaped by depictions of the clothed person in, in works of art. Um, and so when it comes to thinking about mirror images, she talks about the way in which when we look at ourselves in the mirror, you're standing in the vestibule or in the bedroom mirror, in the bathroom mirror, you don't just see yourself in, you don't just see yourself in the reflection. You, you frame yourself. You, you make a picture. It's almost as if you make a kind of provisional portrait for herself. Now, she wrote this book in the 70s. Um, she didn't have the concept of the selfie, but I guess she could have said it's as if, it's as if mirrors are selfie opportunities. Um, and she has this beautiful phrase that she used that I think of often, especially in these last weeks after she died. Um, uh, the picture is the standard by which the direct awareness is measured. We, we make sense of what we see when we see ourselves in the mirror with reference to the picture. Now, there are two ideas in connection with that that I wanted to share. The first is, um, is a kind of 
fairly straightforward one, the idea that pictures shape perceptual consciousness, that we, we, we use pictorial ideas in, in thinking about the way we see. Um, and that's almost, it's almost a point at the level of ideology, as if an ideology of what, of what the pictorial world is shapes the visible world. Um, but what interests me in, in this, in this tr discussion of hers, which I recommend to you, is a further thought that is not often stated. And it is that because of this, because pictures shape or provide the standard by which the direct visual, by which the direct awareness of our own dressed bodies are, are measured, it turns out that our concern, our everyday daily concern with dressing and with how we look is in a way directly a concern, or maybe I should say indirectly, a concern with art. As if dressing is, in the way that looking at oneself in the mirror is, a way of, a way of exploring possibilities in the pictorial domain. Um, and that's beautiful. That means that the teenager worried about the sagginess of the genes is kind of working in the vicinity of art. Maybe it's not art, but it's important in a way. And it's also interesting because I said that the first point, namely that pictures shape the way we see, you might think of that as pictures govern us, pictures dominate us. And certainly in our hyper-image dominated world, there's a political anxiety there about the control that the picture has over us. But the beautiful thing in this other idea is that pictures may govern us, but pictures might also give us the resources to dress differently, to conceptualize dressing as, a suitably, as something suitable for pictorial depiction. And so we we're governed and we're emancipated, not by stepping outside, not by ignoring pictures, but by using them to our own ends and devices. And I'm tempted to think that, and I'm, I haven't really gotten there yet, but I hope you'll see connections between what I'm saying and what Bruno Latour said yesterday. I'm, I'm really struck by the idea that one ought to extend Anne Hollander's thought to seeing more generally and pictures more generally. So there's a sense in which pictures really do provide the standard by which visual awareness, not just of the dressed body, but visual awareness of the visible world is measured. Um, our, our idea, and you see this, I think, in natural science or neuroscience, but you also see this in every aspect. Um, if you, when we reflect on seeing, we, 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 the first thing that comes to mind is a kind of contemplative act. Um, something like the contemplation of a picture. And the second thing is our conception of the object of perception is, as Bruno Latour said yesterday, something like the conception of the still life, as if, as if what an object is for visual perception is this thing which is frozen and is, is selected as suitable for contemplation. And the one thing we cannot do, the one thing we cannot do is ignore the way in which pictures shape the way we think about the visual world and our experience to the world through vision. We can't just repudiate it. We can't say it's false. It's a falsification of what visual consciousness is because it's deeper than that. It's, its organizing role in our lives is deeper than that. And yet, I think we can change the way we see. And we do, throughout historical time, change the way we see. Remember, pictures are at least 30,000 years old, and so is dressing at least 30,000 years old. This is not a new trend, a new preoccupation. And I think it is, and this is the sort of the, the main thought I want to share with you, I think it is the distinct concern, the distinct value, the distinct job of art to bring about that kind of reorganization. I think it's the job of art. I think it's also the job of philosophy. I don't think it's the job of natural science. So I, I want to say that there really is something special for art to be doing. How much time? Seven minutes. Um, so let me now take a step back and try to say something to make this a little bit more, more, more um, concrete. So let me give you a concrete example. This is all by way of giving some background to what I just said. I only have seven minutes. Um, so I think, I think a good place to begin is with breastfeeding. Um, <laughs> human beings are mammals. And like all mammals, we breastfeed. But unlike all the other mammals, we're very bad at it. Um, our infants get distracted, they fall asleep, they start chewing, they, they in some other way interrupt the process. So you've got, you've got this activity, this breastfeeding activity of suckling, falling asleep, jiggling, 
bringing the baby's attention back to the task at hand, suckling again, getting distracted by a noise, and so on. It's this really delicate interaction that happens in time and in space between the feeder and, and the child. Let me call your attention to six features of breastfeeding. One is that in an obvious straightforward sense, it's natural, it's basic, it's primitive, it's biological. Two, despite being basic and primitive and biological, it's also at least an arena for the exercise of quite sophisticated cognitive capacities. Not just doing and undergoing, but paying attention and having one's attention directed and perceiving and guiding and interacting with another. Notice that it's really got a temporal dynamics. It's almost got the dynamics of turn taking. It's one of the first examples of turn taking that I can think of in human life. And it's been suggested, this is not original to me, that maybe it's not an accident that the linguistic species is also the people that negotiate breastfeeding in this kind of turn taking fashion almost as if breastfeeding is a kind of primitive conversation. It's, it's laying the groundwork for the possibility of doing something much more complicated later on called conversation. Um, here's the fourth point. Neither mother nor child is in charge. They don't author this dynamic. Here's the fifth point. It has a function. Breastfeeding has a function. Presumably the function is feeding. Although some have argued we're so bad at it that maybe the function isn't feeding. Maybe we feed that way in order to achieve some other function like attachment building or relationships or indeed just the participation in the activity itself. And then the fifth, the sixth function, the sixth point rather, which is a very important one, it's the one I understand the least well, is that breastfeeding is at least potentially very pleasurable. Potentially, it's not always pleasurable. It can be a very anxiety producing event as well. Um, so the reason I'm going on at this length is I want to introduce the notion of sort of a technical term of organized activity. And I want to say that any activity that has these six features is an organized activity. And by the six features, I mean primitive and cognitively sophisticated and temporally dynamic and organized and having a function but not being authored and being a, a source of pleasure. Okay. Now, in a longer version of my presentation, and I had sort of mentally hoped to be able to give you lots of other examples of organized activities, but I'm sort of protected by time. Instead, I'll just make a few dogmatic assertions. One is I think our lives are almost everywhere you look organized. They're complicated structures, nestings of, of participation and organized activities in this sense. We are not the, the masters of this. We find ourselves organized. Organization, in a way, is, I think, a crucial biological notion. Again, I don't think that organized activity is something that you can understand um, individualistically. If you want to study it scientifically, I think that the relevant timescales are not going to be the timescales of the nervous system, not, not milliseconds, nor, is, nor are the relevant timescales the timescales at which conscious decisions and deliberate action are performed. It's some intermediate level, something like what has been called the embodiment level. Um, and it, it's biological. So any biology of organized activity, and I think we need a biology of organized activity, is going to be a non-individualistic and non-reductionistic biology. Um, here's another organized activity, dancing. I think it's intuitively obvious that it meets my criteria. Dancing has a kind of spontaneous naturalness to it, and yet it is such a subtle communicative act of paying attention, interacting, watching, paying attention, noticing, paying attention to the other, paying attention to yourself. If you're dancing to music, paying attention to music. It's, it's temporally organized. It's, it's got a function, presumably, if you think of dancing in the traditional setting, in, in weddings, funerals, or in sort of social settings of celebration, or, or, or like dancing at the discotheque, you know, courtship, or, or seduction, or, or just play. So all sorts of functions that dancing presumably, presumably has. Um, and it obviously can be pleasurable if you, if you enjoy it. And, it, and it's not authored. When you dance, it just sort of happens to you. You find yourself dancing, or the dance, the dance, you, you, you are danced, one might say, by the dance. Um, now, what's really interesting to consider once with this machinery that I've given you now is what about choreography? Choreography, I think it's very important to notice, is not just more dancing. 
choreography is not just the participation in an organized activity, dancing. Well, you might say choreographers make dances, but on the way I want us to think about a dance, you don't make a dance, the dance happens. What a choreographer does, you might say, is stage a dance. Well, what does that mean? That means put a dance on a stage, or, or, or put a dance on display, or put dancing on display, or maybe put the fact that we dance on display, or put the fact that dancing organizes us in something like the way breastfeeding organizes us. And to give other examples that I didn't have time to discuss, the way talking organizes us. Choreography puts that on display and reveals something to ourselves about the ways in which we find ourselves organized. Um, and then I have just a couple of minutes, but here's the beautiful, the beautiful point. From what I've just said so far, you might think you have dancing over here, a kind of first order organized activity, and choreography over here, the representation or display of it. But of course, and this is related to the point I made earlier about Anne Hollander, the choreography loops back down and changes the way we dance. You know, in a world in which there is such a thing as choreography, there's no such thing as dancing immune to its image. We know what dancing looks like. In fact, we, we can't dance indifferently to what it looks like. There's many, many different choreographic models, whether it's you know, Michael Jackson or, or Barishnikov. There's many, many different pictures to use to go back, pictures which give the standard by which our direct experience of the phenomenon is mediated. Um, and so what starts off in some sense as a coping with the fact that we find ourselves organized by this phenomenon, what starts off as an attempt to cope with that, to understand that, that yields art. That yields, in this example, choreography. But it loops back down and changes what we do at the first order. I think a very nice example is, just, as, just to, to, to fix the idea, a very nice example is, is the case of writing. Writing is one thing, speech is another. But we cannot speak as if there were no writing. That's a, that's a marvelous thing. You know, the linguists always talk about, we've been speaking for 3,000 years, writing is this recent cultural <laughs> thing, but our conception of our own lived life as speakers is shaped by our understanding of writing. And um, th so this goes then to the idea of how it might be possible to um, go from organized activity, which is what I call breastfeeding and perceiving and talking and dancing, to art, and to philosophy, which I think of as reorgan reorganizational practices, practices that really change what we are. And then the final, I've been given the time signal, but the final, the final thought here is that I can't, I, I rem I'm repeating myself, but I think this is so important. I cannot choose not to be organized. I cannot choose not to be organized by, by language. I cannot choose not to be organized by by pictures or pictoriality. I cannot choose not to be organized when I'm a dancer by, by the ways we have danced and the ways we do dance. And that's, that's, that's a source of stress and anxiety. <laughs> we, don't, we just find ourselves organized nest within nest within nest. Um, I think philosophy and art are responses to that. Not by dogmatically saying, stop. You don't have to dress that way. You don't have to dance that way. But by simply from within renegotiating what it is to do it, and thus we get something like a liberation or an emancipation. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to go uh, right, right into our next talk, and then we'll uh, come up and have some Q&A. So Josh Tenenbaum from MIT. Okay, uh, everybody here okay? Okay, thanks. Uh, my name is Josh Tenenbaum. I'm a professor here at MIT in the Brain and Cognitive Science Department, like some of my colleagues who you've seen earlier in the symposium. 
It's a great privilege to be here, thanks to the organizers for making this and having me. It's sort of an undeserved uh, privilege to, to be going towards the end, where I can sprinkle my talk with comments and reflections uh, back on some of the other speakers, including the, the last ones in this session and also back to last night. So in keeping with the sensing theme, I'm going to be talking about some version of sensing and also common sense, going back to Bruno's talk and something I think we're all deeply interested in. And in, very much in, in the same spirit that you heard from Tommy Pojo yesterday, I'm also involved with the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines. Um, this is a reverse engineering talk. Uh, it's a science and engineering talk, but I hope it will have something to say to the humanities and the arts. Um, I'm going to be talking about what I call reverse engineering the common sense core. And I think you can make a contrast here, much as Tommy did last night, with the, the situation that we all are familiar with in technology and the technologies that have transformed our daily lives. What you could call AI technologies, things like these pedestrian detectors or you know, these amazing question answering systems, uh, self-driving cars even now. Technologies that anybody, including the founders of AI, people like Turing who've been mentioned here, Leibniz, you could go back there, um, would have to acknowledge our remarkable achievements. Yet we all know none of these are truly intelligent. So what's missing? That's what we're trying to understand. What's, what's missing? And for me, my focus here, and it's, it's also the part of the Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines that I'm working on, is this, what I like to call the common sense core. Now, this isn't my idea. This is an idea that's emerged over the last couple of decades from a number of different scientists, cognitive scientists broadly uh, construed, including linguists, uh, I think some philosophers, developmental psychologists, vision scientists. There's a lot of connections here to what Alva was talking about, both um, his, his earlier life and his re current life in studying uh, perception and phenomenology, uh, and computer scientists of many different stripes. And I think this is, this is the key idea, that from the very earliest ages, and I mean that from early infancy, maybe, maybe even from breastfeeding days, um, uh, human thought is an, an action is organized around a basic understanding of the world in terms of these key concepts, physical objects, intentional agents, and their causal interactions, or what you might call sort of intuitive theories of physics and psychology, a kind of intuitive physics and an intuitive psychology. And by, by intuitive theory, this is again a sort of a term of art in cognitive science, I mean systems of, of concepts and abstract knowledge that much like a scientific theory are not just a collection of facts, but are principles that can be applied to an endless number of new situations that you find yourself in. Okay. Um, so let me illustrate this by actually talking about some sensing problems. Uh, these are problems that, uh, you know, again, many different cognitive scientists are interested in, problems of, say, what the, the, the pictures on the left sort of illustrate what I think of as intuitive physics in scene understanding and action, and the ones on the right kind of intuitive psychology. And you look at these, and it's not just that you can, as current you know, uh, engineering systems can do, detect the people or detect the objects, right? It's not just what is where, um, but it's understanding what will happen, right? And what can be done. The, 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 the possibilities for action and, and prediction and counterfactual reasoning. Um, what you could have done differently. So the, in that workshop scene up there, you don't just see a, a, a crowded world of objects, but you know that the table is supporting the other objects on it. If you were to remove the table, the other objects would fall. If you were to bump the table, some of them might fall off. Maybe if it's just a, a gentle bump, the tire, the round tire that's leaned up against it precariously would roll off, but the others would be fine. Right? Or that scene over there on the lower left of the house being constructed with the, the wood, you don't look at that and see any of the nails, the, piece, the things which are attaching the pieces of wood, but you know they're there because otherwise it would be falling over, right? So how do you perceive the invisible nails? Or here's a scene from one of our local cafes, Area 4 over there, which the barista described this as sort of a dish, dish bin with a bunch of coffee things in it, uh, as a disaster waiting to happen, right? You know instinctively that if you were to go pick that up and bust those dishes, you, you first have to rearrange them or the whole thing is going to go tumbling over onto the floor. So how do you know that in a glance without even really thinking about it consciously? Or these scenes over here on the right, right? I think these are organized activities, uh, more advanced ones, but the same kind of thing that Alva was talking about. Um, you don't just look at these and see people, but you see a whole kind of intuitive psychology. You get a sense for what they're thinking, what they want from each other, what their roles and expectations towards the others might be. I, I really like the scene, the street crossing and crossing guard scene down there. Think about, when you look at that, what's going on inside that crossing guard's head. You know where she's looking, what she's expecting to see, what she might be worried to see, what she's looking to see, what she's thinking about the people on the other side of her who she can't see and what they can see and what they can't see. Um, what might somebody else, who, a driver of a car coming, be able to see or not see? It's this kind of um, 
understanding of the agents in the world around us and their mental states that's at the heart of common sense. And it's the sort of thing which on the technology side, I think everybody knows is, is, is a key frontier. So this is a quote from some of the tech leads of Google's self-driving car project, where they say, you know, the, the thing we've got covered is the sensors. We don't, we're not missing better lasers or scanners or images, uh, but it's the common sense here. As they say, we do a good job of detecting pedestrians at the side of the road, but we don't yet have built in the kind of intuition for what a pedestrian might do. That's the kind of thing which, you know, as um, stressful as anxiety producing as it might be to be a teenager or the parent of a teenager learning to drive, you're not so worried about this, right? This is the thing that just comes automatically from being a human being. So how can we understand this? Now, as I mentioned, I've been very influenced by developmental psychology, and I think that you can look, look and see this most clearly in young children playing with blocks, playing with each other, playing with each other, playing with blocks. These are some of the basic organized activities that, you know, again, a little bit more um, advanced in life than breastfeeding, but I think you see some, many of the same kinds of themes. I think they basically fit all those six criteria, um, and they are natural activities. Um, it might not have been blocks back in the Pleistocene. It might have been stones. We'll see a little bit about stones later, but it doesn't really matter. Um, or when you look at a child learning about physical objects for the first time, like magnets or silly putty or a touchscreen device, contrast this with what you might be familiar with in the state of the art of machine learning with big data where you have you know, hundreds and thousands of examples and so on. You know, a, a child here is going to learn much more than any machine system gets from just one example. Right? Just the right co combination of you know, the first time you encounter one of these touchscreen devices, and you touch the screen at the right point, none of you can really see what I'm doing. But you know, we all have these in our pockets. Right? Just the right spatial temporal coincidence of how and where you touch and when you touch and what happens on the screen. When you, the first time you saw that, it takes you by surprise, but then you know what's going on and you have at least some idea of, the, of this new causal mechanism in the world. So how does that work? Um, he, here I think are, are a couple of movies I want to show which really highlight the, 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 the challenge in the most sort of lay it bare in the, in the, in the most compelling way to me. I, I think of them as kind of minimal sensing examples, but they fully engage your common sense. So the, the first movie is one on the left here. And again, these are kind of organized activities. So the one on the right, I think, is, is a better and more famous example. Um, but this, this is uh, from uh, two developmental psychologists, Southgate and Chibra, from a study of common sense in 13-month-olds. Now, when, you, when, when I play this, you'll see, hopefully, um, uh, you can see this as a blue ball and a red ball rolling on a green background and some other objects there. But hopefully you don't just see it as um, blue and red ball rolling. You tell me, how do you see this? How would you describe this? What's the activity? Yeah, chasing. The blue ball is chasing and the red ball, is it doing anything? Yeah, running away or fleeing or something, right. So there's, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a competitive interaction, but it's a kind of organized activity, maybe sort of a dance, right? Um, but very goal-directed. Now here's another question for you. Um, which ball is smarter, the blue ball or the red ball? How people say the blue? How people say the red? Okay, everybody says the red. Now why is that? That's a judgment about a certain kind of mental character of mental states, right? Well, to understand what's going on here, to see those goals of chasing and fleeing, you have to understand also something about the other kind of mental state, the belief mental states, that the blue ball has some correct beliefs. It, knows, it seems to know where the red ball is, right? But it also has some false beliefs. It thinks it can fit through those holes which it can't fit through. And not only that, it's, it persistently holds those false beliefs even with lots of evidence to the contrary. Right? So that failure to learn registers on you as not being very smart. Right? Um, and of course, behind this kind of intuitive psychological analysis is also a kind of intuitive physics. It only makes sense as that kind of goal-directed action as chasing and fleeing because of the physical constraints of the blocks. The fact that the balls can't pass through those, those other objects and that they know that, but they both know that, except for the holes part, right? If you were to remove those physical constraints, you would no longer see this as chasing and fleeing. You'd actually see it as more like dancing, um, which is a different kind of activity. Um, so it's, it, it's necessary to see this as a kind of efficient, like that the blue ball is trying to move along what it believes to be the most efficient path to the red ball. That principle of efficiency, as we'll see in a bit, is, is really at the heart of intuitive psychology, but it depends on physical constraints. So it's got intuitive physics wrapped up in it. Now, how many people have seen this famous Hyder and Simmel video here? Okay, um, You should all watch it. It's one of the most famous and most important movies in psychology. It dates from the 1940s, so it's very low quality stop action animation filtered through several generations of analog and digital uh, recording and 
retransfer. So excuse the low quality. But when you look at this again, you won't just see some shapes in motion, but you do see characters in a whole story, right? So you could see two triangles in a circle, but it looks like there's a bit of a competitive interaction. The big one's sort of bullying, the other one backing up against the wall. Now he's a little bit scared and running away. The circle's kind of was watching and is now hiding. And now the big triangle goes and goes to try to find the little circle, cue the scary music, right? There's no soundtrack, but you can imagine it. Um, just like with the interaction between perception and art there. Um, if it gets a little scary here, don't worry. It ends happily, at least for two of the three characters. Um, you can watch the rest of it on YouTube. Just Google Hyder and Simmel. So what's going on in these videos, right? You see, as I've suggested, a kind of intuitive physics, intuitive psychology. Also the one on the, on the right there. You know, think about what was happening when the, when the, at the beginning of the video. It, you, you see it as a, as a kind of a fight or a competitive interaction because you see these force impacts. You see the big one banging into the little one. You see him backing him up against the wall that, that's immovable, right? So you see forces, which in some sense are not really there, right? These are just shapes being moved around from one frame to the other on a, on a board and filmed from the top. But you see it in terms of those forces. And then on top of those forces, you see all these psychological states and even other kinds of intuitive social sciences like intuitive sociology and some more, you know, more morality or ethics. And all from what I, what, what I like to call in my version of what Alva said, which is he really did characterize very well the sort of modern paradigm of cognitive science, asking not just in vision, but in common sense more generally, how do we get so much from so little? I often start off my talks asking exactly that question. So here you can ask that question. How do we get so much meaning from just so little, not just, it's not just very simple images of a few shapes, but if you were to characterize them like with the kind of mathematical description that you saw maybe in Josh McDermott's talk, like time series of signals, these are very much simpler signals than the sounds, the textures that he was playing this morning. It takes only nine or 10 numbers to describe these movies over time, nine or 10 numbers to describe the horizontal and vertical position and the orientation of each of these several shapes. Yet from just those nine or 10 dimensions going over time, much less information than in a musical score or and, you know, a cocktail party recording, you get so much. So how is that possible? I, I'd like to come back in the, in the question period to, to what, what Alva also said about art, which is I think this is totally compatible with the mission of art being to say, how do we get so little from so much in much more in other kinds of uh, settings. But I'll come back to that later if we, if we get the chance. So these, this is the research program that we're working on. We're trying to understand this knowledge in what I call reverse engineering terms, which just means in the same kinds of computational terms we'd use to build an intelligent machine, a robot, both software and hardware. We're really interested in how this comes to be, its origins in, in, in the infant mind, in some combination of nature and nurture, you know, what's innate and how, in the learning from experience. We're interested in how we can fix it when it goes wrong in certain kinds of developmental disorders, like autism or others. Um, we're interested in how we can expand on this kind of common sense in education and policy and the arts. And, and very much, I'm very interested in many of us here at MIT and how we can get this kind of thing into machines. So I'll just give you a taste of how we're doing this. Um, I, uh, in, in introducing me or in introducing the session, people mentioned the idea of Bayesian inference and hierarchical Bayesian models, and people have used the word priors a lot. And I can't give you anything like a really technical treatment here. Um, you might have heard of these things called Bayesian networks. And these are a, a, a kind of technology that's over the last couple of decades transformed many areas of science and engineering. And if you haven't seen these before, just look at this one up here. These are, a network is a directed graph, circles and arrows. And just think of these as ways to represent causal structures in the world. The key idea here is your mind is making probabilistic inferences or just kind of good plausible guesses with in these intuitive theories are basically descriptions of the causal process out there in the world, your mental models of them. So, the, the, so this directed graph up in the upper left should probably be basically familiar to us. It's meant to capture very, very roughly what goes on inside a doctor's head when they're making a diagnosis. You have diseases and symptoms, or just more generally causes and effects. You observe a pattern of symptoms on the bottom, and you want to reason backwards to the pattern of diseases most likely to have caused those symptoms. And of course, you can't be sure from any sparse observation of a couple of symptoms, but you can make a good guess if you have the right causal models and you put the right probabilities on here. And when we talk about doing Bayesian inference on a causal model, Bayesian inference is just taking a causal model, a probabilistic one, and kind of running it in reverse to make good guesses to the inputs or the causes that best explain a pattern of observed outputs of this causal process.
process or effects. Now we do the same kind of thing in more sophisticated kinds of probabilistic models, which we call probabilistic programs, um, that to capture common sense physics and psychology. And they also kind of look like these directed graphs. But notice how I've put words on the arrows here. And that's because the arrows are not just um, sort of uh, stand-ins for tables of numbers, but they're actually computer programs to capture the interesting causal processes that are that our mind or the ways our minds capture the physical and psychological processes going on outside in the world of objects and agents, we have found it, it most useful to build causal models on programs that other people in computer science have built for describing the same things in the world. So computer graphics and robotics are areas of computer science where basically what people do is write programs that describe how the physical world unfolds and how it looks in images. And computer graphics people try to do this in ways that, are, that make uh, you know, because make very efficient uh, approximations very fast, uh, particularly the kind of computer graphics that's used in video games. So sometimes we describe this as a, as a view of like uh, the video game engine in your head. Um, think about pr probably all of you are, are familiar with video games like the kinds that we have on our phones, um, t these uh, sort of physics based video games, right? How many people have played some kind of physics game? Uh, yeah, most of you. If you haven't, you know, your kids or your grandkids or maybe your grandparents have. Um, games where, you know, something like you have to stack up the blocks before they fall over or fill this thing up with water. Um, some of them might even be non-Newtonian fluids. Cut the rope, capture the swinging. Um, think about other kinds of games, uh, like what, maybe it's sports uh, video games or shooting video games. These are... Uh, uh, in order, in order to create these kinds of immersive experiences and, and have them respond to human users uh, in realistic ways in real time, you have to capture in computer programs things that go on in the world approximately. You don't actually have to capture all the things that are actually going on inside a soccer player's head or all the detailed physics of how a soccer ball bounces off the field and how light bounces or how, you know, how light is reflected and, and uh, shadows, you know, all the stuff needed to make that uh, you know, just a freeze frame of a movie of a soccer game look realistic enough uh, to immerse you in the experience. But you have to capture it somehow enough. And we, and we think that, that in some sense your brain is doing the same thing. Your brain has similar kinds of models of how objects move, how light uh, bounces off things, sort of graphics basically, and how agents have goals and pursue them. Um, that uh, we, can, we can use the same kinds of programs that have been uh, designed to build this, but by putting them in one of these Bayesian frameworks, we can run them backwards. So you observe the outputs of these programs and you make guesses about the inputs. In other words, you, you observe the experience that you're in. It's not just observation, of course, it's interaction, but you get the data of your experience, which is like the video game of your life, and then your brain is making guesses about what were the inputs to these programs uh, you know, things like the mental states of the other agents and the way the physics are unfolding. And that's, I guess, all I can do in this short talk to just give a sense of the kind of models. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, in the time that I've left, just give you a sense of how we use these models and some of the implications where you go for this. So we do experiments, now it's sort of simpler and stripped down here, to test the intuitive physics engine in your head, if you like, uh, where we show people a bunch of uh, stimuli like these. Each, each one of these frames is one stimulus from an experiment. And you might make a simple judgment, like on a scale of one to seven, how, how likely do you think it is that this stack of blocks will fall under the influence of gravity? So probably most of you agree that the ones on the upper left look pretty stable, whereas the ones in the lower right are likely to fall. And indeed, that's what most of our subjects think. So this is an example of the data from an experiment where, on the, where we asked maybe 10 or 20 subjects. They, we take their judgments, average them, and we're plotting along the, the vertical axis the mean judgment of a group of subjects. So each one of those crosses is one of these towers. And a cross which is high up near one means it's very likely to fall the whole tower. A cross which is low down is one that is, is very stable. And then along the x-axis, we're plotting the predictions of this model that I sort of sketched out to you. Basically, what it's doing is it's trying to, it looks at the image, makes a guess at the, the three-dimensional positions of these blocks, and then runs a simple sort of Newtonian physics simulator a few time steps forward in time under a couple of, makes a couple of different guesses, because it's not exactly sure where the blocks are, and under that uncertainty kind of sees what's likely to happen. And what you get there in the, in the x, the horizontal position of each cross is our model's guess of how likely this stack is to fall. 
And you can see it does a pretty good job of people, predicting people's common sense judgments here. There's a few stimuli shown in those colored frames, and they correspond to those dots there. So the one that's in red is an example of one that people think is very unstable, and indeed our model says it's very likely to fall. Interestingly, though, it's actually not. It's actually, this is sort of an illusion. If you were to actually perfectly measure all those blocks on the, in the red frame there, the very tall, precarious one, and perfectly localize them and perfectly simulate physics, it would be stable. It's much like these things. You might have seen these um, other kind of physics illusions here um, if you spend some time out on the coast um, uh, or in art galleries. This is a pretty artistic rendering of, of uh, one of these rock balancing things. Where how many people have seen things like this, either in the real world or in pictures? They're really cool. These are, I mean, these may not, these, ho hopefully this doesn't look stable to you. It looks like the rocks should be falling, but they're actually stable. They're just balanced exactly right. If they were just slightly in a different position, they would be falling, but the, the art here, right, is to get them into a position that, that, has, that makes them look balanced. Your brain thinks this is unstable the same way it thinks that thing is unstable because probabilistically it is unstable, right? It's not generic. There's just one precise alignment of these blocks in the right red frame or these rocks here that, that works. And your, but your intuitive physical intuitions, your physical intuitions are only probabilistic. Um, now, we've actually been studying, this is, by the way, work mostly done by Peter Battaglia, who was in my group until recently. Now he works for a particularly interesting part of Google called DeepMind. Um, and uh, he's actually extending these sort of ideas to look at a range of other kinds of physical systems, not just solid, rigid objects, including fluids, including even non-Newtonian fluids. But I'll talk about that later. I think this is a very interesting place where the cognitive science and art can interact. We've also studied the same kinds of intuitive physics in babies uh, you know, by showing them much simpler displays of things bouncing around. And I won't go into any of the details because I only have a few minutes left. But this is an example of a, a stimulus you might show a baby. It sees a few objects bouncing around. And then after a moment, it, it'll uh, be occluded. And one of the objects will appear. And you can essentially ask a, a young baby who can't speak, how surprising is that under their intuitive physics? And you can vary different factors, like whether it's the blue or yellow one, or whether it's the one that's close to the door or far from the door, or how long the delay is between when it's occluded and when they come out. And you can, it turns out you can quantitatively predict, as this graph here on the right shows, Infants' looking time, which is the standard measure of surprise. Infants look longer, just like you, when they see something surprising. You can predict that with one of these probabilistic intuitive physics measures. And this is really one of the very first times people have built any kind of quantitative predictive model of anything that infants do. Um, I think it's, very, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice example of how these probabilistic programs can be taken all the way down to the core of common sense, even in very young babies. In the center here, we're working on trying to reverse engineer how this kind of physical knowledge grows, but I won't go into that here, sort of future work. The same kind of model can be applied to the intuitive psychology case here, right? But now we add into these physics programs planning programs. What's a planning program? Well, again, I'll point to a phone. You're all familiar with you know, what Google Maps does or Waze or navigation things with GPS and maps, where you basically say, I want to go here, and it knows where you are now, and it has a map of the city, and it plans out a route for you, right? That's the, you know, a self-driving car does a fancy version of the same thing. That's basically what any, at the heart of any robot acting in the world is this rational mapping from what you could call beliefs and desires to actions, where beliefs include your general model of the world, where you are, your state, your desire is where you want to get to. And then planning is, again, some kind of finding an efficient, uh, you know, sort of minimal cost sequence of actions to achieve your desires given your beliefs. This is a way to formalize a very classic idea in intuitive psychology, the sort of belief, desire, action, Rash, you know, rational agent model. And from the context of Bayesian inference and probabilistic programs and common sense, we think of what, we're, what, what the common sense human being is doing is observing the actions of others, seeing them as the result of a rational planning program, the effects, and working backwards to the causes, the hidden mental states, the beliefs and desires in the other person's head. And we can use this to build again, quantitatively predictive models of this aspect of common sense. So just to illustrate the, the intuition behind this, um, I'll show you one, one example from Chris Baker's work in our lab. This is a, the food truck domain here. So uh, again, uh, with, as at MIT, if you're, if you're on campus or maybe in other places where you've been, imagine a grad student going to forage for lunch one day, or maybe what you might have done during the break. Um, there's various food trucks that come to campus each day. On this, in this little world, there's three kinds of trucks, Korean, Lebanese, and Mexican. And there's all, but there's only two parking spots. So some days, you know, Korean gets there and Mexican, some days the Korean and Lebanese. Here we see a day where Harold, our grad student, has come out of his office here. And he can see, by the way, just in his line of sight. So he can see on this side of his building, 
let me get my cursor here. You can see the Korean truck has come and parked in this spot. He can't see what's on the other side, though he knows there's a parking spot there, because there, there always is. So he, what does he do? He goes this way. He goes past the Korean truck to the other side where he can see the Lebanese truck. Then having seen it, he turns around and goes back to the Korean truck. So the question that we might ask people here is, what is Harold's favorite kind of food? Is it Korean, Lebanese, or Mexican? What do you think? Yeah, Mexican. Now, isn't that interesting, right? Because he didn't go towards Mexican, right? Standard com computer vision algorithms, you know, will we'll see some, an agent or a person reaching for something, try to analyze the visual motion, say like, okay, I'm reaching here for my phone, so you think that's my goal. Um, here, what we perceive him doing is going towards his mental representation of something that he wants and hopes is there, but isn't actually there. And in fact, our, both our, our model, which, is, which can make that inference, and people not only think that Harold, uh, you know, his, 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 his favorite truck is Mexican, but also that he believes it was likely to have been there when he started off, because otherwise it wouldn't have made any sense. We can make this more quantitative, but I won't go into it. We can also, um, and I think this brings back to several of the other talks, but, uh, both all, basically all the talks in this session, is we, we can turn this into what I think is a, mo a model of people's mental models of these organized activities. And I think the most basic one, which breastfeeding, as you, as you put it, maybe is sort of the first example of, is what you could call helping or caretaking. Developmental psychologists in cognitive science have been very interested in these kinds of activities. Um, and I, I won't, I, again, I can't go into the details, but if we want, we can talk about this in the question period. But infants from, from a very early age seem to be sensitive to watching other agents, including little you know, animated shapes like circles and triangles, which ones are good or bad based on whether they seem to be helping or hindering other shapes. And, and what we've been able to formalize, what does it mean to, to see something, to see an action as helping in terms of this kind of planning framework where basically it's to take the desires of or, or one agent is helping another if that the first agent takes his desires to be some kind of function of the other person's desires. The way these get formalized, I guess I didn't really quite mention, is in terms of a computational extension of classical economics, if you like, in the same way that our physics engines extend on Newton, this extends on the early ideas of expected utility theory. We can again talk about, uh, you know, if we want to come back in the discussion to neuroeconomics and whether util you know, expected utilities are a good way to think about the actual ways that our brains work, but they seem to be a good way to think about how our brains think about how brains work, right? Um, th and that we can formalize the idea of, say, a, a desire as, as, as a kind of utility function, and then a helpful desire of sort of recursively having your utility function depend on another agent's utility function, a kind of a, goal, a golden rule, if you like. Um, these kinds of things can actually, these, these kinds of common sense physics and psychology can also be studied in the brain. So again, it's, I'm, I'm out of time and I will, I will stop, but I'll just refer to my work of, or my work of my colleague Nancy Kamwisher and a bunch of people in her lab, and they found basically with simple kinds of intuitive physics and intuitive psychology tests, uh, testing, again, people's intuitive sense of whether there's a joint activity going on or not. You can find dissociations between large brain systems involving multiple areas of the brain that seem to underlie these, these aspects of core common sense, physics and psychology. You can also find dissociations in various kinds of developmental disorders. But again, I'll refer you to Nancy's work on that. And I would also refer you to the work of a number of people in robotics, um, including Rod Brooks, who many of you might be familiar with at MIT, or Peter Beale's group at Berkeley. I'll just show you this nice video here. Um, if you're not familiar with robotics, this might not look like much, seeing a robot tying a knot. But it's, it's incredibly impressive. And partly it, what it's based on is the robot having one of, doing one of these sort of physics-based planning things, using some of the same kinds of ideas inside the robot's head. Um, the, the very last thing I'll, I'll end with, and then we'll go to the discussion, is, is, is of course looking, looking beyond common sense. So I've emphasized how we can try to use ideas of computation to reverse engineer common sense, but I think many of us are interested in, in what goes beyond that. So for example, the origins of knowledge in theories which are not just intuitive theories, but scientific theories. Like we ask, how did Darwin come to his theory of natural selection? Uh, by looking at finches in Galapagos, or Mendel come to his theory of genetics from studying pea pods, or Newton come to his theory of gravitation from looking at orbits of planets and dropping apples and so on. Well, in some sense, it's, it doesn't fit into the model that I've talked about, but in other ways, it does build on it. And this is a frontier area that, again, we're just working on. I think it's also interesting to come back to one of the themes from last night, to, t to, to think about some of the challenges that face us on a societal and global scale, like, for example, you know, our, our society's um, inability to grapple with issues like climate change, or our whole globe's inabilities to do this, and to think about both ways in which 
understanding, you know, understanding what these common sense intuitive theories are like and understanding a computational framework that can, that can both say what is the core of common sense, the kind of theories that are of the physical world, for example, that are present even in a young infant, and also understand how that's similar to and different from, say, more sophisticated scientific theory, that that can help us understand both why, uh, under, why in some ways people fail to grapple with what's really at stake in climate change, but also maybe give some hints on how we, what we can do about that. Okay, so I'll just uh, conclude. I've, I've talked about what I call the common sense core as this very early developing understanding of the world in terms of intuitive physics and intuitive psychology. And I've, tr I've tried to at least sketch out how in our research we're reverse engineering this common sense core and something about where it comes from. And I think this will be uh, not only of interest for cognitive neuroscience, but for many other people. Um, the, the technical idea behind this you know, is, is something that I could just gesture at. But if you're interested in learning more about this, I would suggest uh, d reading up on the topic of probabilistic programs. And I just wanted to end with that Hyder and Symbol video, or just bring the picture back there, because I think uh, it's very exciting. I think we're actually starting to understand something of what's going on there, but also to um, to bring things back to what art uh, and, uh, does that science necessarily doesn't, I think even this, this video here, which was constructed by hand by two very artful psychologists, has a lot of art in it that we, don't, uh, we aren't able to handle. Even, even something as simple as this, I think our models are just scratching the surface of what we experience there. So again, something we could come back to in uh, the discussion. Thank you. So I'll ask Alva to come back up, um, and Carrie Lambert Beatty, who I introduced earlier, uh, an art historian coming to us from Harvard, will be moderating a discussion um, with these two uh, panelists, and then we're going to slide uh, in, a, in about 25, 20 minutes mm -hmm. into uh, Q&A with the audience. So, so shall I be sitting? Yeah, we, oh, and Tomas. We should all, all come us, up if any all of us. Yeah, yes. and do you want to do you want to be here or? Um, I'd be happier doing it. Okay. As yeah. Part of the conversation from the beginning. Yeah. I know that on that side of the room you can't really see, so I encourage some of you. If there are chairs over here, at least you'd be able to see. If you can't see around the uh, podium. So I thought that um, this panel was totally fascinating and um, was going back to thinking about sort of the structure of this incredible symposium as a whole um, and how it has moved from individual senses um, to thinking about sensing in general in the session today and um, from perception which was our focus in the two panels, uh, in the panel yesterday and the one um, this morning, to questions of action, if I understand our sort of brief here. And therefore, you know, what do we do with perception? Right? How does that, um, and how do artists, um, scientists, engineers, historians um, help us get at some of those problems, both of how we do it um, and of what we should do, right? What kind of actions? Um, it also was a session that seemed to me to um, be uh, perhaps problematically um, but interestingly related to an idea that I know um, Alf is very strongly associated with, which is this idea that we are not our brain, right? Um, that so, and that um, the limitations on thinking. Um, of consciousness as um, bounded by, embedded in, and, and sort of a product of the brain machine, as incredibly useful as it is to find out which parts of the brain do what, um, that we want never to lose sight of the way that um, the action of neurons, the action of, um, uh, of cells um, with the perceptual system is nothing is really happening until those things are interacting with the world, right, and with the body. And that's what we, when we talk about consciousness, um, it's something um, both infinitely complex, but also infinitely relational. Um, and this was something uh, that I was thinking about a lot today. 
um, in part because of something that happened at one of the previous panels, the one um, about color, where a kind of classic question about um, color came up um, a couple of different ways, and that is, how do I know that what you say is, you know, that when I point to this and say green, and you point at it and say green, that we're back actually seeing the same things. And like Tauba Auerbach, I remember this as like my first big abstract, mind-blowing thought as a kid. And um, it's, of course, one that a few um, decades in college and graduate school taught me is just not a problem, right? Because I've been taught that it's not a problem because the, uh, because, you know, we can think about pragmatically, right? Green is what we all say it is, and let's get on with things. Um, or we can say that that whole model, the sort of anxiety that drives that question um, of how can I ever know what's going on in your brain, right? The, um, that that is kind of a false problem, and I think that Alva's way of thinking about consciousness um, uh, is, is one among um, other sort of philosophical models um, like phenomenology and so on that help us um, try to think otherwise. Um, and yet, that question and problem persists, right? It's, it's maybe not quite possible to get out of. Um, and uh, I thought that um, part of what we were talking about here today as we moved into thinking about consciousness in action consciousness of others and trying to produce organized behaviors, um, trying to improvise together, um, trying to uh, create kind of new systems of experience, um, raised some of those issues for me again. And maybe it's something that we'd like to come back to. Um, does anyone want to sort of take off from there? I'm looking at you. Mr. <laughs> Brain is not. Oh gosh, you, you went you went for the the hardest and most truly un, unresolvable question. I mean, this we I mean it's so interesting that two things seem to be true. One is that we don't actually suffer from very powerful existential anxieties about whether, for example, our kids don't see the same colors that we see. At the same time, we find it almost impossible to talk ourselves out of that puzzlement. Right. Um, sim very similar, similar in, in general. We, if you think that all that I know of you is what I see, what you say and do, the, ex the, ex the exterior features, how do I ever get the confidence that you are a source of, a locus of consciousness yourself, or that you have a mind yourself? And yet, and yet. it would be cause for clinical concern <laughs> if I took that possibility seriously. And I think, I think that shows that, in some sense, the, the puzzle presupposes a, a, a theoretical framing of the issues, which, which isn't, isn't the right one. It isn't the real one. It isn't the live one. And it's a pretty historically specific one, culturally and historically specific, I mean, at least, right? I mean, did, does every culture worry about whether we see the same green? Well, well, one thing I'm sure we can all agree, as you've already sort of indicated, is this particular one about color, it starts early. Yeah. I mean, I think I've, I've heard children raise it spontaneously at a very, very young age as, as a sort of an obvious, an obvious possibility. And yet it's not a source for concern. I mean, there are, there are real sources of concern about what's going on in the minds of others. Mm -hmm. um, if you think of gaslight or, you know, um, is, your, are, is, is, is somebody trying to manipulate you or yeah, control yeah. you? Uh, does somebody love you? Is somebody actually trying to cheat you? Um, but not, does red look to them the same way it looks to me? Uh, that, that question doesn't arise. Actually, the, most, the, the person who's, who's been most uh, effective at, at, at labeling and describing this problem is a former MIT philosophy professor, Ned Block. He had, he had a very good way of putting it, because it's, it's very hard to dissociate the linguistic from the, the substantive in the, mm -hmm. in, the, in the language question. So for him, the way to formulate it is, how can we tell that the things we both call green look to me the same way the things we both call red look to mm -hmm. you? Or can, so we have to sort of factor out, take for granted that there's no behavioral dissimilarity between us. What's left? What, what residue is left for puzzlement? If you're waiting for my one-line solution to the problem, I, I don't have it. Um, does the but you do you might you might no I, I don't have a uh, <laughs> I don't have a one line solution but I, but I think uh, what we do offers some 
ways of thinking about some of these aspects. But I, I mean, I, I, I agree with most of what you said. Um, certainly, and just the way you put it, like that the, the, prob this, the problem of you know green and red and shared subjective experience. I think it's a huge puzzle, and I think it's not a worry. <laughs> and it's right, interesting that it's right. a puzzle, but not a worry. Right. I think anybody who starts to think about how minds work um, will be puzzled by it. <laughs> and I do think it's probably culturally universal to think about how minds work, because even young infants think about how minds work. We, different people in different cultures might think about that different. question differently, yeah. but right. we all think about that. And I think that does, I mean, the, this sort of common sense core perspective I was talking about mm -hmm. might have something to do with why we don't seriously question whether somebody else is a is a you know an inanimate object or a zombie or whatever. Is that from the very beginning we really have a few basic ways to understand the world. We can understand the world in terms of inanimate objects, like objects subject to forces, and then we can understand the world in terms of some other kinds of objects, which um, have these have internal mental lives much like our own, right. and exert forces on the world in order to achieve goals subject to beliefs. And that, that's we have basically a very small number of um, models like that. Yeah. And there are systems in the brain which are, which are there in part because of evolution putting them there mm -hmm. and in part from our early experience which are responsible for that. It's not that we can't understand other things in the world like the complex causal feedback loops involved in global warming, but those take a lot of other resources. They build on language, they build a lot of conscious thinking and they're hard, hard won and often not very won. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, so I, I think that perspective is consistent. And I also think that the, kind, the reverse engineering perspective that I talked about uh, maybe not. Maybe some of the parts of it that I didn't talk about, but I think parts that are shared between me and a lot of other people in brain and cognitive science is is consistent with some version of the idea that you know we are not our brains, or you can't understand thought and consciousness by just looking in, inside. It's very much not biological reductionism. Right. It's you know think about engineering and engineering, right? Like you can't understand why your computer works the way it does, or why the software works the way it does, or why any engineered system works the way it does without understanding the social context in which it's designed to be used. And I would say, you know, again, I don't think I hope this won't sound reductionist, but I would say evolution has designed our brains to be used in certain ways, which only make sense in terms of these organized activities that our species participates in. So it's a it's a view that says if you want to understand, I mean I, I don't I don't think it's it's that mm -hmm. different. I mean, I, I would say that some of my neuroscience colleagues often look uh, like they take a different perspective, <laughs> like that if you just focus on spikes or molecules inside synapses, that that's the heart of things. Yeah. But I mean, I think I have, in that sense, I have a lot more sympathy with what you're talking about <laughs> than what some of the same people in my own department do, at least as far as how it's going to bear on questions of intelligence. I mean, what they do might bear much more directly on you know, how you might develop drugs to cure certain kinds of diseases, right? But I think these are, you know, these, these different ways that the cognitive neurosciences look out to the world, I think the kind of reverse engineering perspective that we have is very uh, broadly consistent with the kind of perspective mm -hmm. that you're talking about. It's interesting, um, in t when, during your talk, I was thinking a lot about anthropomorphism, mm. um, which is, um, which your, your model, at least the way you demonstrate yeah. the core common sense seems to imply is, um, is, is it's actually kind of fundamental to how we look at things. Is that yeah. fair to say? Yeah, right. I mean, you mean in the sense that we can look at circles and triangles. And in we the right impute sense. belief to yeah. them. Yeah, that's right. Because if, if, they, if they move in ways that are consistent with forces being generated to mm -hmm. maximize expected utility, basically, those are, and those yeah, are all yeah. things we could yeah. formalize, or they move in the way a self-driving car seems to move, you know, then, then yes, it makes sense to anthropomorphize them. And the anthropomorphism is, of course, you know, can be a very dangerous yeah. thing to do. But there's also people now who are, would argue that a kind of um, tactical use of anthropomorphism is necessary exactly if we're going to be able to rethink um, and become sensitive to mm. Gaia, as, um, as Professor Latour was suggesting. Um, in other words, yeah, these questions about climate and political um, and uh, um, incredibly complicated questions have maybe at their root how do we understand our relationship to things? And it mm. sounded like you're saying that's actually one of our very core yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know, brain powers. I don't think I understand the Gaia idea enough to know whether that's a valuable one or not for, for solving uh, global problems. It might, it might be. I mean, I, I think that you know, the, the, the picture I put up there is a, as a little slide from some mm -hmm. people's climate change presentations. To me, um, from the little I know about the problem, the, 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 the thing that most we should most worry about are these mm -hmm. feedback loops where 
you know, global warming will lead to changes, say, in the tundra that will release much, much more methane than any human caused yeah. action does. So things that can just run away and get out of control. And there are, I think a lot of people have an intuitive theory that says, well, you know, if, it's, if humans are causing the problem, then well, you know, okay, when it gets too bad and we, we can't breathe, we'll just back off and it'll be okay, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Without realizing that you could cross a point where you, where you can't back off, where even if you stop doing anything, th the problem would just be out of your control, right? So, so that, that idea of a kind of co a complex feedback dynamic is one that, you know, exists some, in some places in the physical world, but it's not part of our core intuitive physics. It might be part, more part of our core intuitive psychology, right? Like these kinds of you know, bad dynamics are things we're more familiar with in relationships, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, including sometimes when breastfeeding is less pleasurable and more anxiety producing, right? Um, but so it might be that, that anthropomorphizing in that sense would help us understand some of these complex feedback loops hmm. in a way that just thinking about the physical system as a purely physical system wouldn't. But it's also possible that we just need to uh, help, help people develop better ways of understanding that, you know, causality in physics isn't quite as simple as just one ball hitting another um, and coming up with ways to understand more complex but not kind of common sense core kinds mm -hmm. of physical causality uh, would be useful too. And does that maybe sound like a way of describing some of the things you're up to in projects like the one you showed today? Yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, I mean, I don't know how to put it, but you know, it's very simple. You know, when I talk about this butterfly effect, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, for me, is, uh, I mean, what what I'm always uh, somehow preoccupied is like, you know, when I, I don't know, last year I broke one of my legs, and I was walking all the time with crutches on the street, yeah. and then suddenly you see in the street that everybody's walking with crutches, or <laughs> half of the population is with crutches. <laughs> And then I was very preoccupied because of this. I said, oh, my God, then, you know, you start to see, oh, the road is not well built, and, oh, you know, it's a, a lot of things that you don't see. I, I never saw that there were other people. Work. And then somehow then I got better, and I don't see, never again, I see people now with crutches. <laughs> they're all gone. And they're all gone. And it's like, and you know, it's like, a, and, you know, I'm all the time busy, and you, um, how, uh, you know, I can, you know, and, and I like, with Bruno, no, it's like how we can become more sensitive, or you know, or how I can stop forgetting something, mm -hmm. and only when it happened to me, then I start to see in somebody else that is, is you know, is another problem, you know, and then when there are minorities, uh, you know, like the weakness, the ill, and, and you know, then it's you know how I can activate this in in, in my senses, not to kind of uh, forget when my problem kind of disappear. Um, it's, it's very interesting that you, you can't help but see the figures in, in uh, the videos as, as animate. Um, we, seem, we seem to be able not to see the globe as animate. It, and you know, Vic, the philosopher Wittgenstein once said, we only attribute mind to that which, which has a face or, or looks and acts like us. But of course, what it is to look and act like us is really an abstract notion. Because in what sense do the triangles look and act like us? Um, and yet, with a kind of a, a question I wanted to raise, and it's not a challenge, it's, it's just simply an interesting, an interesting question, is you know, the, the Bayesianism, the reverse engineering, uh, the belief, desire, psychology, and inference, all of that suggests a kind of a theoretical attitude to the world, as if there's the world, it's this uninterpreted something, let's figure it out. And then the, the idea is that each of us, each of us as a brain and a body, has this burden to figure it out for him or herself. But the amazing thing is that that's not what we experience. We don't experience, we're not, we, don't, we don't live life as detectives. I mean, in some yeah. domains we do. You know, um, my colleague Alison Gopnik wrote a book, The Scientist in the Crib, about these developmental yeah. accomplishments. But what's so interesting is the non-theoretical quality yeah, of our no, relationship well, with each other. I yeah, look at you, yeah, I see your yeah. animacy, and I don't, I don't infer that your animacy on the basis of what I see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, that's, I, but I think, um, yeah, I mean, words like infer can mean many different things, but I, I think that the view that, so, so Alison is, uh, Alison Gopnik is very influential in my thinking here. Also, Susan Carey, who is, uh, you know, has been married to Ned Block for many years, yeah, and, yeah. and some of his ideas and her ideas also very, very influential. Mm -hmm. And I think, I completely agree with that, and I, and I think there, we, we as a field are starting to understand actually how to resolve that tension. Mm -hmm. It's that there are some kinds of common sense theories, you could call them, 
which are yeah, mostly unconscious. They're present in very young infants. And they're, they're fundamentally different than sort of later developing mm -hmm. scientific theories or the kind of intuitive science that Allison is talking about. That, you know, that, that, that they're, they're not really subject to, they're automatic, they're not subject to the same kind of belief revision and sort of rational checking against all possible evidence. They're very modular, you know, to, mm -hmm. to cite maybe the opposite philosophical tradition. They're sort of like these Fodorian yeah. uh, yeah. theories, right? Fodorian modules, if Jer Jerry Fodor is the person we're referring to. Um, but then it's, it's so, so, so that, that seems to be, to me at least, the, a way to describe this very early developing common sense that we can't help but apply everywhere. But then there's also, um, later developing intuitive theories, which are more explicit, more verbalizable, very much caught up with learning language. They only really come mm -hmm. on when, you, when you're looking at three and four year olds and kids uh, mm -hmm. where you could say one of the things that happens when you start to learn language mm -hmm. is you re-describe, among other things, and part of learning about the world, is you re-describe these core domains of intuitive physics and intuitive psychology in words. You start to, you start to talk to yourself and explain to yourself you know, what makes something balance or be stable? Or why do, why do people saying the things they're saying? And you see this really interesting phenomenon that across these and other domains in physics and psychology, you see what developmental psychologists often call U-shaped curves, where kids suddenly sort of get worse at things that when they were young infants, they were good at. So there's class, you know, classic examples of this are in the so-called false belief task, right? That, that three-year-olds traditionally fail to understand ways in which somebody else could have a, a, a belief that's out of, register with their understanding of reality. And it used to be thought that, that that's just only something that's learned when you go from three to four, but then it was shown by, by Rene Bayerjean and others uh, about 10 years ago that actually even young infants can do that. Hmm. So, but it seems like when you're telling a... Depending how you measure it. Depending how you measure it. If you measure it non-verbally and, and sort of unconsciously and automatically. Hmm. But if you tell a story in words and ask them for a response in words, then of course, you know, a 12 month old can't do that. Mm. A three year old can do it, they just get it wrong and a four year old gets it right. And you have the same thing with these kind of intuitive physics like stability, you know, does this, is this stably supported by that? There's inferences that 12 month old makes uh, understanding aspects of center of mass, which a six year old might get, get it wrong, but then a seven year old might get it right. Mm. So it's, there's something about language and the way language both you know, mediates our experience of the world and our cognition that is incredibly essential, you know, valuable and essential. Right? We wouldn't have the culture we have without language. We wouldn't be able to have the interaction we're having now without language. Um, it does enrich and extend our early developing intuitive theories, but maybe there's also sort of, I guess, an initial cost. Uh, but I, I don't know. I think it might be, if we're going to talk about how to um, get beyond certain limitations or, or, you know, resist instinctual responses to things, I think we're going to have to engage with that part of our brains, the sort of language-based, more explicit part. At least that seems to be what cognitive science is telling us. It's that's the part that's 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 malleable that education acts on. Mm. Um, the other part is no more really intervenable on than our sense of green and red. Okay. So does that mean we're about ready to open it up? Yeah, I think we might as well. Yeah, open up to bigger to the to the audience then at this point. So, let's do it. Uh, microphone over here. In the interest of time, I can speak loud. Um, <laughs> when you spoke about uh, core common sense, you did not mention any of the artistic urges we have. You alluded it might be too difficult, but do you think that is maybe for our beyond common sense urges, the art playing that role? Did you do any research on that or are you working? Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think here I would, I would defer to the other panelists on that. But what I was referring to about that when I pointed to the, the Hyder and Simmel thing at the end is, I, you know, I, I think what you said about the, the artistic uh, uh, sort of orientation, that's, that's the, it's not about how do we get so much from so little, but how do we see so little and so much. I would say that what you see in those Hyder and Simmel videos with the triangle and circle, right, that's the, that is getting at the core of this automatic common sense, that when we look at a much richer experience like just the world around us, our everyday life, people, actual people interacting on a, on a, in the street or in our life, any of our real experiences, our brains are boiling it down to two triangles in a circle, right? That's the core of our common sense. And all the rest, we're missing. <laughs> like whether somebody's got crutches on or, or an infinite number of other things. So I think maybe what, what you're 
what your colleague might have been getting at, and maybe what you were getting at, is there's all these other aspects to experience, which, which are not just what's shown in the triangle and the circle, that, that uh, because they're not part of our core common sense, because it's so important to us, to, to, how, to our most basic organized activities that, we, that we've um, sort of pruned those out and focused on certain essences, that actually we, you know, we, need some, we need other ways, and art can give us other ways to be sensitive to those. Um, I think that there's, there's a key, there's a nice difference between the, the, the Hyder and Simmel, the triangle circle, and the, 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 the chasing. I think the chasing scene that I showed, that um, we can understand that perfectly, basically. The models we have basically explain what's going on there. There's nothing very artistic about it. And it's, it's important. That was designed to, to study 13-month-old intuitions. The Hyder and Simmel video with the triangles and the circle and this whole story, that was by, designed by social psychologists to study almost everything, <laughs> right? So even in that, even that scene, I think, has, has many, um, many aspects of thought and, and consciousness that, that we put onto it that I don't yet know how to understand, um, that, uh, you know, looking forward, we'd like to understand, and that somehow the, the, art, the, the artistic rendering of it was able to capture these things, you know, these, these aspects. And then there's all the rest of real world experience, which um, doesn't fit into even the two triangles in the circle, which um, I think most of us are, are just not even seeing because they don't fit into this common sense core. Do you mind if I just yeah. if I just add I don't I, I don't want to contradict you in any Please way. Please do that. No, no, I, I, but because I think I think there's not a disagreement. It's yeah. maybe merely verbal, but I think it's worth maybe mentioning. Yeah. And that is that I think there's a very important sense in which it would be a mistake to say that when we walk down the street, we're just experiencing circles and triangles, even if um, it is true that um, what we pay attention to or what we notice is, is or the, the, what we see is a function of what we're paying attention to, what we're noticing, what we're concerned about, what our task is. Um, it's very important that people show up as people and cars show up as cars and the sunshine shows up as the sunshine, yeah. even if in some sense it wouldn't be in an individual economic rationalistic model of how to predict the behavior. This, as, it shouldn't be one to understand human experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's you are, not, you are not just a moving dot on a, on a two-dimensional screen for me. And, and that's, that's so, it can, I think it's so interesting to point that we don't, you see, if you, think of, if you think of what's represented in our heads, then you are left with saying it's triangles and circles. The point is we don't need to represent mm -hmm. the world for the world to be there for us in our heads. <laughs> it's, we have access to it, thanks to the fact that it's there and that we have all sorts of skills when, yeah. we, when we need the access. Mm -hmm. I, I'm... I'm not sure I understand all those words, but I think I would agree with most of them. <laughs> Maybe even all of them. Yeah. Fair, fair response. Uh, in, to Is this on? in Thomas's artwork, um, he basically created a social psychological model, I think. It was like a social psychological experiment. Um, in which uh, people had to think as a group to survive. And I'm wondering um, if you could project common sense theory onto, uh, if it's possible, I think we're trying here, to project it onto through a social psychological lens and um, how might it relate to a larger population because you talk about intuition as something that can be generalized statistically. So we're talking about large numbers anyway. Yeah. That make sense? Do you understand maybe, the question? I'm not sure, maybe. Are, are you asking me to, to see if I can uh, un understand what Tamav was doing? Or Why don't think you about talk more? to Thomas? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love your both stuff. Of you. I wish I was there in the hangar. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, it, it looked like a social psychological yeah. experiment. Is that how His, you thought of it? No. No, I'm asking. Yeah, oh. or, 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 or maybe to people who were, I mean, so you were actually one of the people in there, right? Um, I mean, did you feel like you had, you were, working together with the other people to survive? Or were you, did you feel like you were more in your own body or? Both, I wasn't, it wasn't a question of survival, no. But I do think there was some of this intuitive physics involved yeah. in it. Because again, it was that um, losing certain aspects of your sensory yeah. apparatus. So you couldn't really communicate verbally. You couldn't really walk. You could see depending on which layer you were in better or worse, that kind of thing. So. Yes, yeah. you had to reassemble your, um, 
your uh, ways of navigating the space. How come so, you couldn't communicate verbally? Was it too well, loud? Because it was loud. There was that roar. I mean, you could try, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. it, it suddenly you realize, okay, that's not the most relevant. It's also hard thing to, to establish do. the usual communication channels. Probably mm -hmm. people are floating all around you in different ways, mm -hmm. and you can barely see them sometimes. And right, and you're, the, the it is moving as you're. Yeah. It's, I think it's through it. So. Yeah, but it, 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 no, and also the, I mean, your body and the weight of your body talk much more quicker than what you could express verbally. Yes. You know, because it influences your presence just as a weight. Yeah. Because the medium is so unstable, it, it go much quicker. Does uh, it feel like you're communicating with the other people there in how you move? Like, do you feel a kind of you, tight interaction you, of yeah. like a dance, for example? I wouldn't say it's like a dance, no, but in order to accomplish something, I mean, there does come become a sort of utility moment, you know, in order to accomplish something, yes, there has to be a kind of duet, I suppose one could use that analogy. Maybe more like driving, less like dancing and more like driving, sort of. I mean, I think... In the sense that you're, in the sense that you're relying on another person's perceiving what you need and acting in such a way as not to run you over. Well, yes. <laughs> It is interesting to compare the experience maybe of being there with like the experience of being a red and a blue ball chasing each other around in this case, right? Because there what made that activity make sense was these physical constraints that you couldn't pass through, uh, you know, that the, the walls basically. Whereas here what you've done is you've put some, fi some physical constraints or you know, cir circumstances to motion. Yeah, well, well right. some of them are constraints like it's, oh, there's good ones like you're not falling <laughs> right? <laughs> down to the ground right. at least. Um, you can't, you know, you could see someone on one of the upper layers if you're in the middle layer and you can't actually touch them or get to them. Um, so there's some constraints, but they're very different from our normal experience in a lot of ways. You can see through these layers, unlike most obstacles, but they're also, um, you know, they're, they're, you're always moving around. So it's, I mean, it, it, it seems like a really interesting way of, yeah, sort of taking people out of the normal ways in which say our interactions with other people, our intuitive psychology depends on intuitive physics, like it's different intuitive physics. So to the extent that there's any kind of sort of interaction with other agents going on there, it's, it is sort of changing the, the rules of that game in some way. Yes. That seems, that would be very interesting. And it is playful too, it is fun. So you, yeah. call, you do call on that experience. It looks stuff. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back, back over here, this woman in the blue shawl. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right. Um, I think I have a question for every single panelist. It's one single question, um, and I want to bring a concept which I haven't heard from any one of you, and I wonder why that is, and if it's useful in any way. And it may overlap with um, the uh, intuitive physics, or perhaps the naive physics, as I have someone uh, sometimes read, um, but also the kind of projections of somebody else's behavior and how you can anticipate and react to it. And this is um, a term which comes from art history, but also dance spectatorship, and it's kinesthetic empathy. And it looks as though we would kind of cross uh, kind of a number of realms in which you would say, um, as a human being, I anthrop anthropomorphize, sorry, geometric objects, but also I kind of uh, would put myself in their position, and I would move around that kind of environment in the same way. And that would be a kind of a, um, yeah, a kind of a, a generative bond or kind of anticipation of how these different agents would move about in space and how would I react to them. So can I say again, if you haven't heard that from anyone, and I wonder why, and if it's in any way helpful to you. I can just say that I think um, Caroline and I in talking about this session and what we were trying to accomplish, I mean, she was bringing into play the idea of joint action. So this reciprocity, and I mean, Josh can talk much more effectively about this than I, but you know, the, mir the mirroring effect that we are sort of tuned uh, to do and we do um, anticipate someone else's actions and then react to it or mirror it or slightly alter our own in response. So there is, well I've heard Tomas use this phrase, I'm trying to get people to tune to one another. Mm -hmm. So he, sometimes I think, I think that's why you're moving towards sound and vibration and that, so that's becoming a more important part of your work because he's understanding that perhaps in the way that um, musicians understand each other when they play an ensemble or something. I don't know. You can comment on that. You, you know, I, I wasn't there, so I, I don't know what it's, what it's like to be there, but just giving you an observation from the outside watching the videotape, I didn't see a lot of kinesthetic empathy. 
You know, what I kind of actually saw was individuals exploring their own sensorium. That was the impression I had. I don't mean that that's the case. I'd be curious to know if that's not, I mean, how much it really isn't the case. But it struck me that each, everybody was sort of thrown back on themselves. And while they needed each other to solve certain problems, it, was a, it looked like a slightly self-involved state that they were in. But I, but I bet you could imagine a, 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 a similar setup in which maybe with a smaller number of people, uh, it would be, there would be more, it would be more dance-like or, or more social interactive. I mean, I don't know if you... Have, have you, you ever slept on a, on a, on a waterbed? Yeah, you? I was going to say waterbed. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, exactly, you know, every exactly time they saying. roll over, yep, it wakes yep, you up. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a kind of kinesthetic yeah, but, empathy, yeah, exactly. or at least the breakdown mm -hmm. in it. Yep. <laughs> right. I, I was going to give the same example. So when we're talking about but, cultivating that kind of empathy, but across time and looking toward the future, and I'm bringing it back here to you know, the, the, the angel of, of Geo's story, and um, what, what is she to do to grasp that future that is so sort of horrifying? And can, we've been talking a lot here about uh, sort of ph phenomenologically rooted exercises and experiences being in time, or seeing triangles and circles reacting to each other in time. But, so I'm just struggling and wondering how to translate that insight, whether we reverse engineer it or sideways engineer it, which is kind of how I think of Tomas's work, how to translate into that uh, so, some sense of the, the, the climate change, uh, this sort of temporal, complex layers of causality that it seems are suggesting we don't have in our common core. Right. So, is this a question of well, I think our transduction again, I think or our translation? common sense physics, our common sense physics is basically like billiard ball causation, um, mm. and we, you know, we understand some things about friction and mass and like very simple Newtonian mechanics. And not and a lot. There's a lot of things in Newtonian mechanics that we don't understand. In, like our, our our intuitive physics famously does a bad job with angular momentum and other concepts, which really you only see when you study you know systems that are rotating at high velocity, um, which again are not ones that were very um, uh, common in our evolutionary history or in the experience of, of young children. Um, certainly, I'd say more, more our evolutionary history. Um, so, I mean, I think climate change, I mean, we, bar you know, we can barely understand slingshots is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, climate change is a much more complex sort of thing. And when we try to think about, we try to apply intuition to the physical, the inanimate world. I think, I mean, like, to put it um, pretty bluntly, I think most people in sort of First world uh, societies like ours do, are, are not gayists. They, they, they think that the world is a physical system, not an animate one. So they apply very simple mental models that are not that much more complicated than billiard ball causality. You know, one of the things that very young infants show, one of the slides I showed from Rene Bayerjean's work, um, uh, by, by five months she showed, but not by two and a half months, infants start to understand the basic <coughs> principle of conservation of momentum and collisions. That if a medium sized ball rolls down a hill and knocks an object a certain distance, then if you show them a much larger ball, they expect it might knock that object a farther distance, but not if you show them a smaller ball. So that's a very rough kind of conservation or understanding of transfer of momentum. But it's a very simple linear one, right? Bigger ball, heavier maybe, knocks it further. That is not the way climate change works. Right. But if we're thinking, if our core uh, common sense physics is that kind of a system, then it's no wonder we're not going to understand the, the feedback loops of things like, you know, well, what happens if the Arctic uh, tundra starts melting and then met, and you get much more methane than any humans are producing, right? That, 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 that's yeah, I and I see problem. Tomas's work and uh, Bruno Latour yeah. and the global Gaia circuit as trying to sensitize in some way to well, a yeah, range so of different ways. They, they yeah. have different possibilities yeah. for sensitizing. So one is think about it like an agent or a system of agents. <laughs> That might be a version of Gaia. Another one, like the, I like your non-Newtonian <coughs> fluids example, right? That's another one is, hey, the physical world is more complex than just uh, you know, the first few pages of a Newtonian mechanics textbook. And maybe if, if art could show, could give people a sense of the ways, even, the, even it, the, you know, everybody agrees that cornstarch and water <laughs> or whatever is inanimate. <laughs> and yet, look, you amp up the Kenwood speaker to 60 hertz and above, and it starts behaving in very non-intuitive and even somewhat animate ways. Well, that's, that is one very simple way in which this kind but of there's, art. There's an, oh, yeah. I just wanted to, because I think this, the way in which um, talk about climate change um, and ecological emergency yeah. is filtered through the whole symposium has been um, 
interesting and unexpected. Yeah. Um, but I think w when we talk about it, we also have to remember, I mean, I'm not sure that the problem is every individual's need to understand um, the science of climate change, right, as much as it is concerted political efforts yeah. to debunk yeah. science so that what's missing is their understand, is, is an understanding of um, well, it's a complex problem, and it has a, it's a complex right. problem with a, a bunch of different aspects. I think. Yeah, of I, course. I guess I was just thinking of individuals I've met who who've undergone kind of conversion experiences, uh -huh. where when they understood what the causal thing was, they totally changed That's not only their own actions I, but their whole careers. And, I, I think it's important to to separate the question of yeah. what it is to understand and take seriously the reality of climate change from somehow having an aesthetic intuitive insight into the world mm. as, a, as, a, as a unit. Because yeah. one of the really interesting things about the world is it's not an object for us to contemplate. It's, it's our world. We're inside it. And um, I don't, I think while there is, you know, we, before we were talking about anthropomorphism, in a way that was the, the wrong idea. Because I, I, think, I think the guy hypothesis, as I understand it, is not the idea that the world has a mind, but that the world is alive, that it's a living, <laughs> it's a living entity that's one system that's, that sort of has the kinds of properties of self-organization that you find in, in, in living things. Mm -hmm. But to say that is not to say that we should therefore attribute intentions or desires or needs to it in, an, in, in, an, in a truly anthropomorphic sense. And I don't think we can take up the relationship to the world as the world is my baby or the world is my friend or the world is my mother. I, think that, that, I, I don't think that's an intuitive way to think about it. But we can terrorize ourselves about what's happening to our world. And I, and I live in California. People wash their hands differently in California than they do here. They turn the water on, they wet the hands, they turn the water off, they lather the hands, they turn the water on, they rinse the hands, they turn the water off. They don't go flip off. They, it's really different. My kids have been raised with terror about the world, which is, which is not an interpersonal thing. Mm -hmm. right? that's, a, that's a metaphysical thing. Yeah. Um, pick one. Hello, thank you very much for the very interesting speech. My question is open, I guess. Um, I was uh, wondering um, if, if we say that um, an embodiment experience cognitive, like Thomas's uh, uh, artwork, is uh, somehow changing belief and uh, through an intuitive experience, these beliefs that uh, Josh was talking about are, are altered. And so this models and reorganizes our awareness to try, in a way, I, I was wondering how, uh, and you also mentioned, Josh, that as, as infants, um, these intuitive experiences were um, it, it ultimately, I mean, very soon became language. And uh, I was wondering, uh, in, in terms of lab experimentation or phenomenology or artistic, how, uh, what has been done in terms of trying to <clears throat> do the reverse, uh, so try to experiment with language in, in that it, it is used in a different way so that it will create an empirical emb embodied experience that will reorganize um, and, and create this awareness. So what has been done in terms of even virtual, virtual mental images and, and how, uh, what, I mean, what, what do we know um, in terms of uh, mental images, language, in terms of how it is applied in, in all this field of remodeling and reorganizing our awareness? Did I make um, sense at all? Uh, um, you, you made a few different senses. I'm not sure which one you, I, I, I have anything to say about. But I guess, again, I'll try to say very briefly, I'm not a language researcher primarily, but from what I've learned from colleagues who do work on language, that yeah, these same kinds of um, common sense core theories that are present in early infancy about intuitive physics and intuitive psychology are at the heart of early language, right? And are the first words we learn and the syntax of even our first sentences that we construct, they're, they're building on these kinds of concepts. So language builds very much on this. At the same time as then, it completely transforms the way we're able to think. 
um, you know, we, the, we can construct uh, models in words, whether we're Isaac Newton or any one of us here, um, that just don't fit at all into our basic intuitive theory. So, so am, am, I, am I getting at that at all? I don't know. You are, but I would like to know, not just in terms of uh, language, but also language as vir virtual mental image. So not just in its interaction, but it, it, its own yeah, manifestation. I mean, I mean, so there's peop people uh, how, are, what has been done in terms of experimentation to create and, and create a, 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 a cognitive uh, transformation through language, either, either speech or, or mental. Uh, you know, what, what has been done or what is being done in, in, in these terms, if you know of anything or... Yeah, I mean, the, the, probably in, in this panel, there's not enough time to go into, but there's a huge number of interesting experiments out there. People looking at, say, for example, eye tracking, what you're, what you're looking at as you're processing language. Um, I don't know, there's people who've worked on how language transforms what you see. I mean, we talk about color. So going back to that theme, right? Um, so, uh, one of my former colleagues here, Lara Boroditsky, was uh, well known for studying how, you know, the experience of learning a language like Russian, where you have two different words for two different shades of blue that in English we just call blue, right? Um, roughly sort of a, a dark blue and a light blue. Um, how does that change your, your percept in some fundamental way? There's, that's, that's, I mean, there, that's, I guess the, the, the interface between language and perception is a very exciting area. And it does seem like uh, in some, some cases it might, but it's, but it's pretty hard. I mean, if there's one lesson you draw from that, it's that again, like sort of perception and a lot of the core common sense stuff we're talking about here that's present early, it resists, um, you know, language can, can give you other ways to think, but it doesn't redraw the basic cognitive contours of that infant mind. But language, sorry, just language as um, in I that it, it creates one more. Yeah, in yeah. that it creates have. experience. That uh, we, let's. We, I'm happy to talk more about this after. But thank you. But just, it's just worth yeah, very very quickly mentioning that um, although it, there's two, it, Thomas's work affords us an opportunity to talk at great length about it. And that's really interesting, that there's so much to be said about it, even if it's not a primarily linguistic vehicle. Mm -hmm. And moreover, it does so much to us, which is not linguistic, which we can talk about. I was thinking there was a, there was a show in London a couple of years ago, which I wonder if you saw. It was, actually, it was in Germany as well. It was called Choreographing You, mm -hmm. or Move, Choreographing You. And the idea was works of art that make you, cho that choreograph you. Mm -hmm. so, there was a piece in it by Forsyth that consisted of rings hanging. And, in order, and what you were supposed to do is climb through the piece. So you put one foot in one ring, hold on to another ring, raise your foot up onto that <laughs> ring. And so, but you ended up, it's like a kid's jungle gym, but you ended up being choreographed in this way that you could look, you could just stand there in the room and watch people moving in ways that was absolutely dictated, as it were, by the affordances of the objects, but completely unpredictable in terms of normal human movement. And I had that experience also watching you. The strange, if you sort of abstracted away from the fabric that was holding them, you found people in these, in these alternative poses that was, yeah. that was striking. Well, you can, I mean, a chair choreographs yes, us. Exactly. And so yeah. it's choreographing something else, something that we don't ordinarily do that right. work like this. Right. Us. Okay, for the last question. Here. This is a question, I guess, directed um, towards Alva, but I guess we can open it up. Um, I was interested in aesthetics. Um, we have, we've talked a little bit about aesthetics, and one of the notions of aesthetics that came from Professor Latour's talk was the idea of rendering a sensitive to Dot, yeah. dot, dot. But it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, that the notion of aesthetics that you're talking about, Alva, is actually not exactly about rendering us sensitive to, in the sense that it's not about, say, the revelation of phenomena, the exposure of phenomena, but it's also about the way in which aesthetics helps us fashion ourselves as subjects in our interaction with the world. So when you're talking about the, the painting and fashion, right, there's a kind of important dialectic that's happening here, right? We become subjects insofar as we are engage with the work of art, but it's not necessarily an act of, say, rendering sensitive to or, you know. So I was wondering if you could comment, elaborate a little bit more about the kind of aesthetic theory you're talking about. That's very, that's very helpful, actually, because um, is Bruno Latour still here? I don't know. But, but he made a comment. He, he, he said, I'm using the word aesthetic in its original meaning, 
where he really was essentially, he meant it as, as a perceptual faculty. And we can cultivate our perceptual faculties. If you, if you read Arabic, you can look at a page of Arabic writing and see the individual words. You can cultivate that sensitivity. Um, we're all experts at reading each other's facial expressions. And if we're all English speakers, we're capable of understanding what we're saying. So we cultivate, um, in that sense, our aesthetic sensitivities all the time. And I don't think that has anything especially to do or particularly to do with art. Um, art is something to which we are blind, however, if we don't cultivate aesthetic sensitivities to, to what it's playing with, to what it's doing with. I mean, another, an, an example of, of an artist that I think beautifully illustrates this is, um, oh no, all of a sudden I've, I've uh, forgotten his name. Um, he's a German choreographer who's not really a choreographer. Uh, Tina Sagal. Mm -hmm. So, um, in fact, that's, we had this conversation about Tina. So, it, when you went, when you saw Tina Segal's work at the Biennale in Venice last year, you didn't see it. You walked right through it. It was, it was people on the floor. It, they were invisible. They were invisible until they weren't. So one of the beautiful things about that work and about performance in general is very often performance is invisible, except that it gives you resources. It's like an online, quick, real-time tutorial to see it. So all of a sudden, it comes into view. So you would have people on the cell phone standing in the middle of the dancers on the floor. And then they notice that all these people are looking at them. And then all of a sudden, they realize they're in the piece. And then all of a sudden, there's a piece. And so, so that there is a way in which art is concerned with the cultivation of a sensitivity of a perceptual kind in something like the way Bruno Latour said. But then there's this further question of in what does the, the achievement of a sensitivity to the meaning or significance or importance of the work consist? And in a way, that's what I was trying to get at, this idea that works of art do this other thing, which doesn't have to do with just seeing them. It has to do with defamiliarizing, destabilizing. So if you think of, of Thomas's work, it brings so much into the foreground, which is otherwise in the background. Our, our frailty, our vulnerability, our, our dependence on gravity. And in, in doing that, it gives us the opportunity to be different. And our responsibility, right? And our responsibility.